Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and this is your Rattlecast pre-show for Tuesday, October 22nd. We have a great show for you today. Um, Janet Fitch is going to join us, the international best-selling author of four novels, uh, which are all very successful and wonderful. And um, her most recent two novels are about poets during the Russian Revolution. So she's going to be on in just a little bit. Um, hang on a second. She's going to be on in just a little bit, and we'll um, be reading poems from the novel, written by her characters in the novel, which is going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be a unique show. I don't know if we'll ever do a show like this. We're only on episode number 14, but this is already one of those that I don't know if we're going to be able to repeat anytime. Um, so this is the pre-show where we stretch out and uh, you get your drinks, find a comfortable chair if you want to, if you're watching this. After the fact, archived on iTunes or Stitcher or uh, Facebook Live or something, you can skip forward uh, about 15 minutes and then Janet Fitch will be on. But for right now, we're going to do a few poems uh, just to warm us up. And uh, tonight, as we speak, it's probably about the third inning of the first game of the World Series. And um, as a Mets fan from Western New York, I don't know who I can actually root for. Um, I uh, don't really like the, the Yankees, and I don't really like the Nationals, so I'm, I'm more than happy to be uh, rattle-casting instead of watching the game tonight. But I thought we would do a few uh, baseball poems just to, to get into the spirit of the evening. Um, today's Poets Respond poem was by Devin Balwit, and um, it's a baseball poem. So uh, let's get into that. This is uh, A Member of the Jury by Devin Balwit. And uh, let's see, Devin is the author of several chapbooks, including How the Blessed Travel, Forms Most Marvelous, and In Front of the Elements. Um, she's poetry editor for Minute Magazine and teaches about adult ESL at the Portland English Language Academy in Portland, Oregon, where she lives. And here's her poem from today, A Member of the Jury. A member of the jury. Last night I couldn't will the Cardinals a hit, although I tried, beaming smack after smack through my eyes. Each was swung through, the umps hike, punctuating the batter's grimace. The guys with the best uniforms, two bright birds perched on a bat, deserved not to be swept, but swept they were. I had better luck at jury duty at willing my name to be called, unlike most others in the room who wanted nothing more than to go home. In voir dire, my bored peers lofted one disqualification after another, relatives and law enforcement, strong opinions on the matter at hand. What stance would increase my chances, I wondered. As if the judge had read my thoughts, he admonished, don't tell us what you think we want to hear. I'd give anything to know what the lawyers saw in me to seat me in the twelfth chair. Today the Astros face the Yankees. After performing my civic duty, I'll watch the slow duel between batter and pitcher, willing homers that never happen, and cursing the other team's outfielder as he snags a would-be run or makes the double play. My decision will have helped exonerate a man or punished him. The defendant will have kept his eyes on me, as if our willing could make anything so. So that was Devin Balwit reading her poem, uh, A Member of the Jury, which is one of those poems, I don't publish poems based on whether or not I relate to them, but I really relate to that one because I both, um, you know, love, love sports and baseball and uh, think that I can talk to the TV and uh, help the team. And I also love being uh, on jury duty. I know not everybody is privileged in the kind of way that they can um, get off of work and, and go if they want to. But if you can, it's such a great experience. Uh, um, just the, the nature of um, I don't know, the civic value of it and, and seeing how serious everybody takes everything. I always really appreciate that. Um, now, here is another poem we're going to read really quick as we roll on. We're 10 minutes away from joining Janet Fitch. This is a poem... Uh, called Ark by Jesse Bertrand. And uh, Jesse Bertrand uh, is a third year MFA student in poetry, at least when I grabbed his bio, he was. Uh, he has worked as a carpenter, an actor, and a middle school teacher. He is co-director of poetry at Roundtop, 
an annual poetry festival in the Texas Hill Country. And here's his poem, another baseball poem, Ark. My dad worked the trades for 15 years. He learned four names for sheetrock mud that nails measure in pennies by their length. And if he went to bars, he could say rusty nail until the words corroded in his mouth and still they'd bring him scotch. And through those 15 years, he had three wives and my two sisters and then me. And we all asked him to be better than he was. It doesn't work like that. You shouldn't ask a hammer to act like a baseball bat. And if you're on a job site and you call out sheep's foot, cat's paw, cat's claw, crow's foot, deck wrecker, then you're saying, you know what it does. My father's favorite story is of the motel room and billings we stayed at on a renovation job. It was just me and him. When we turned off the TV, we could hear the infield chatter from the low-A minor league ballpark next door. We were so close, we'd sit out on the ashtray of our balcony and holler at the peanut man, toss me a bag. Of course, it didn't work. But we both liked to ask for things we knew we would not get. And then it did. And I love that ending. Um, we both like to ask for things we knew we would not get and then did. Um, and here is a third baseball poem. This is by Jane Byer. She's a Canadian poet. She lives with her wife and two children in Nelson, British Columbia. She writes about uh, human resilience in the context of raising children, lesbian and gay issues, etc. Um, she spent many years working for the city of Toronto in corporate health and safety and now works for WorkSafe BC. And you can find more about her and her work at uh, janebyerspoetry.com. That's J-A-N-E-B-Y-E-R-S poetry.com. Here she is with her baseball poem, Baseball. Baseball. My parents bought me a left-hand glove because I am left-handed. They did their best. They had to parse the mystery of foreign gestures the coach touching his peaked cap, tapping his chest, the crouched catcher signaling between his legs. They asked what kind of sport was played on a diamond. Was the soil hard? Would I be rich? And home plate, was it made of china? Why is the shortstop not short? What is a bullpen? Some days I answered patiently. Another glove was out of the question. I knew not to ask. Savings gone, less meat for a week, because of a leather extravagance. Cricket players don't wear gloves, was quickly shushed by my mother. I learned to throw with my right hand, weeks of quiet practice. Pitched tennis balls careen off the garage wall, never accurate, but I did get strong. Peering from left field, I hoped for pop flies, but other things distracted me, like the way they sat erect in the stands, reading their foreign paper. My teammates would squint at the outfield, following the line drive to my outstretched glove. Their cheers prompted my parents' mistimed applause as I hurled the ball in an errant direction. I gripped the bat and swatted like mad at the incoming pitch, but half of swing is attitude. I tried to earn my way with a solid hit. Then, stranded on base, I waited for the coach's signal, though stealing home is always tougher than it looks. Baseball is not a game of effort so much as belonging. Each fielder standing alone, occupying territory, or planted over home plate, guarding inheritance. So that was Jane Byers. 
reading her poem, Baseball. That was from Rattle Number 35, which was a tribute to Canadian poets. And I thought I would read one last poem. This is my favorite baseball poem. Um, and this is why I love baseball. Um, let me find it for you really quick. This is uh, Peter Harris's poem. Will Buddhism survive? We don't have this on tape, so I'll just read it myself. Uh, but Peter Harris um, has taught at Colby College since 1974. He's the author of the book, which I think this is from, Freeing the Hook. Um, and his poetry has appeared all over the place, the Atlantic Monthly, Prairie Schooner, etc. Um, and this is Will Buddhism Survive, which is why I play shortstop. And uh, this, is the, this is the only thing I like about baseball, but, but this is it. Will Buddhism Survive? Only if we all become that second baseman who dove to his right, snagged the liner, thudded to a stop on his belly, too late to get up or change hands, too late to do anything but what he could not do, had never tried, could not have done if he had tried, shoveled the gloved ball backhanded over his back without looking to the shortstop. No, not to the shortstop, but to where the shortstop would be when he flew across the bag, barehanded the ball, towed the bag, swiveled, elevated above the maverick ox of truth barreling down on him from first, high enough to make the throw for the double play. Game over, the not doable done, outside scriptures, outside thought, no sound at all, inside the redundant thunder of applause. And that was Peter Harris. Uh, reading will buddhism survive and for me baseball is a very buddhist kind of experience it's the it's the time i get to experience the no self of uh of enlightenment i think it's the only time um let's see so we have two minutes until i'm going to give uh, uh janet fitch a call but i should say uh, rattle is a publication of the rattle foundation a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry we've been publishing rattle magazine since 1995 and um, these podcasts are a way to celebrate poetry. Um, I don't know if I printed it out. Yeah, I don't think I have it here. But um, I have the whole schedule filled out for. Um... Oh, here it is. Okay, so I have the whole schedule filled out for the next, for the rest of uh, 2018 for these rattlecasts. And um, so next week we have Francesca Bell. But listen to this. This is such an all-star cast of poets here. We have Francesca Bell next week, then Lynn Knight, uh, winner of the one of the Rattle Poetry Prizes and a Rattle favorite. We have Wally Swist, Nicole Brown from To Those Who Are Our First Gods, Bob Hickok, reading from his new book, Hold, Naomi Shihab Nye, reading from The Tiny Journalist. Uh, Tony Gloegler is going to read his uh, books about autism along with the anthology Alongside We Travel. That's December 10th. Then we have uh, Peter... E. Murphy, who has a really cool book called, um, I didn't write it down, but it's more, oh, I can't remember the title of it, but it's Poem Prompts and um, All the Poems They Inspired. So it's a really cool book. We're looking forward to that. So I um, hope you enjoy these Rattlecasts. If you do, please, where you're watching or listening to this, click the like button, or if you're on iTunes, give us five stars. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you're watching. And um, join in on the open mic if you want to call in. Um, all you have to do is have Skype on your device, and uh, it's a free app, and give me a chat message to Rattle Poetry, all one word. I'll reply to let you know if you're on, and I will call you when the time is right after we're done with Janet Fitch in about 45, 50 minutes. So um, it's 6 o'clock, so I'm going to throw up the splash screen, get the bumper music on, and call Janet. So I'll see you in just a little bit. Thanks so much for joining us.
So uh, we have Janet Fitch on the line. Janet is the author of, as I mentioned before, um, four novels, um, starting with the international bestseller White Oleander, which everybody's definitely familiar with, and a great book, Paint It Black, which was made into a, um, another motion picture. And, but her two most recent books, uh, The Revolution of Marina M. and um, This Chimes of a Lost Cathedral, are both about poets during the Russian Revolution. So we thought it would be a lot of fun to um, do a poetry reading um, about the poets from the book. And um, I'm going to bring Janet Fitch in right now. And uh, hi, Janet. Uh, you're on. And uh, everybody can see and hear you. So, so hello. Yeah. Hey, Tim. Good to be here. Thank you for the experience. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's my pleasure. It's great to... Uh, it's great to have you on. Uh, for everybody who doesn't know, uh, Janet Fitch was one of my professors at USC. I learned everything I know about fiction, which is not that much, but everything I do know about fiction, I learned from Janet. Uh, she's just an amazing author and a great lover of poetry. Um, so so um, did you want to start set up sort of explaining um, what the book is about, maybe? Sure, sure. Well, there's it's uh, a two-volume uh, novel about the Russian Revolution, the Revolution of Marina M. And uh, the new one is Chimes of a Lost Cathedral. And my uh, main character, Marina Makarova, is a poet. Um, and she begins the first volume. She's 16 years old in the middle of World War One, and she is in love with Anna Akhmatova, as uh, is every girl her age, uh, every literary girl her age is in love with Anna Akhmatova. Uh, it, it was the silver age of Russian poetry, uh, and all of these people were very much alive. She was living in Petrograd, which was St. Petersburg before the war, um, and they walked among us. We actually, she has... Uh, she sneaks into the Stray Dog Cafe and actually meets <laughs> Akhmatova, and Mayakovsky is there and reading, and Kuzmin is there, and uh, you know it's the was the great the greats um, met and hung out and drank and mm -hmm. um, made love <laughs> and whatever else they did, and she was a kid and just spying on the gods at play. Mm -hmm. um, now, during the revolution, uh, her family was a bourgeois family, and it came apart uh, when the Bolsheviks uh, took over, and she sided with the Bolsheviks, and she sided with um, her friends who were, uh, she had a boyfriend who was a uh, um, radical poet uh, named Genev Kuryakin, who was, his idol was Mayakovsky, and he has, writing poets is, I mean, I don't write poetry, but my characters write poetry. And it's different than writing your own poetry because I know what they've been reading. I know who they idolize. I know what's going on with them. And uh, so these poems are, are intrinsic parts of the novel. They're not something I can just put in the end mm -hmm. and you can just put leisure. Um, so uh, they're part of the action. They they always they refer to what's going on with the character, and it's they're written through the character's personality. So um, uh, I find it really fun. I'm I'm a great lover of Russian poetry, and uh, they are live in the novels. Um, in the second novel. Um, my character, who has had all kinds of adventures, um, has uh, been out in the countryside during the Civil War and returns to Petrograd um, uh, after some huge dramatic uh, events and is introduced to the House of Arts, which um, was the centerpiece of Russian culture during the, uh, during the Civil War. The intelligentsia was starving uh you were you didn't get paid money you got ration cards when you worked and uh they were considered bourgeois so they did not get work therefore they did not get ration hmm. cards therefore they were starving and 
Gorky, who was like the only independent voice in Russia at the time, uh, founded institutions where the intelligentsia could work and um, then they could get ration cards, they could teach and not starve. So he single-handedly saved the intelligentsia. And one of those institutions was called the House of Arts, where um, poets and writers uh, could live, so they had housing, they could get a rat ration cards, and they could teach in the, there were, there were workshops. And they, they also loaned, loaned them out to factory committees who would want a poet to come and teach a class to factory committee, would send a poet out, and they would get bread from their students. And sometimes that was the difference between life and death. And Gorky founded something called World Literature, where he employed a lot of these poets and writers to uh, tra translate world literature into Russian for the common man. And they it saved mm -hmm. the life of hundreds of people. Um, the Russian intelligentsia was very well educated. Many of them spoke three languages, four languages, and translation saved their lives. So my character comes to um, into the orbit of the House of Arts and eventually ends up living there. So these great poets are living, breathing characters in the book. So I get to write, you know, Mandelstam, and Gorky is a major character. Um, Bloch is a major character, the, the great Silver Age poet. So this, the book, this Chimes of the Lost Cathedral is mm -hmm. just overflowing with poetry. So I got very lucky in that um, uh, Boris Dreljuk, who uh, was one of the editors of the Penguin Book of Russian Poetry, uh, did original translations for me for Akhmatova, for Mandelstam, Mykowski. Uh, I would just come up against a poem that I needed to mm -hmm. use because... <laughs> You know, poets especially, but all literate people, you know, we carry these these verses in our heads. And so when something comes to mind, then the, the poem comes to mind. And then it needs to be translated. So mm -hmm. he was great. He let me, let me write him notes over the trans. I'm like, oh, can you do this bit of Akhmatova? Or can you do some Tsutayava? Um, so it, it's just been a literary immersion the last 12 years of writing these two books. And, and, and you did a lot of research, right? So it's very much historically accurate. Like there, you know, your character, your main character is invented, but, um, but, but everything that happens in the book was, is based on real. So it's like a history of, of Russia, too, at the same time, right? Yeah, it's like we all live in history. Mm -hmm. You know, this everything that's going on around us and we do we live in history and then what's our reaction what's our response to the events around us we don't live you know swimming in mid-ocean mm -hmm. and uh, so this book is very much of a person moving through history the way it affects the people who aren't in the room mm -hmm. where it happens the rest of us kind of feel yeah, the effects yeah. and so feels the effects and sometimes she's closer to the to knowing what's going on and sometimes she's further from what's going on um she has a friend who is a bolshevik who she actually did some uh sort of spying mm -hmm. for because her father was in the, in the uh, bourgeois government uh, after the fall of the czar and she passed information to this girl and the girl became uh, an officer in the Cheka, which was the political police. And there were no regular police. I mean, crime was amazing um, at the time. But uh, there was a vicious, um, committed circle of these political police who, um, you know, were devoted to smashing the mm -hmm. class, basically. And um, so at one point, my character does get arrested. Um, she's living in the country, hiding out from a crime situation mm -hmm. that she gets involved with uh, and gets picked up by the political police. And uh, I thought I'd read that. Yeah, poem. yeah, that'd be great. 
So that's called Alice in the Year mm -hmm. One. So she's picked up by the political police, by the Cheka. She's locked up in Cheka headquarters, brought back to Petrograd, Petersburg, and uh, is locked up in a cell for weeks. And she's not called and she's not tor tortured, um, but she is there with hundreds of other people who all have their own story. And she's finally brought in for interrogation into the basement, into the shop, you know, into the kind of a shower room uh, with a drain and blood and you can hear people screaming and, mm -hmm. you know, she's being interrogated and her friend finally does come for her, but not without strength, unfortunately. So she gets out finally. She's living with this friend under kind of uncertain terms and the friend wants her to write a poem in celebration of the first anniversary of the revolution. And though she believes in the revolution, she's very idealistic, she's becoming less idealistic. And there she sees that there's, you know, she has mixed feelings about the year one of the mm -hmm. revolution. So here's the poem that she writes for her friend who thinks that she should be writing a poem uh, in honor of the revolution get on the back on the bus it's called alice in the year one alice in the year one i slept just fine on your floor like a baby who doesn't love concrete it makes you stand up straight but what to do with a spine in our current condition you ask for a poem for the year one. I greet it. Das Darovie. Excuse me, comrades. I seem to have lost my drawers. She lost her underwear in the arrest. Um, like many of you, I was born naked. I thought the revolution would solve the problem, but it continues despite the edicts. Sorry, I forgot. You wanted a poem. A celebration. Hurrah! Hey, you, Dievishka, with the fire in your hair. Tell me, where does the future sleep at night? Can you see it from here? Yesterday, your silhouette in the doorway of a lighted room. Come into the future, you said. I peered in. Boom. No, my sister, it won't do it. See that ceiling? Rooms in the future must have no ceiling. They block out the stars. Down with ceilings. Who cares if it rains? But comrade, we need more skies. Tell Narkoprod the sky rations ran out before 8 a.m. and I was almost to the head of the queue. We demand more sky. Second of all, no walls. Things happen behind them, and not only the blah blah of the neighbors. Walls hold you too tight, like an overbearing nurse. I don't mind being naked in public. That's a poet's job, to be naked for all of you. But I don't care for swaddling. And don't let's forget beds. That fluffy stuff, it's simply passé. What good are whispered words on the pillow? What good are dreams? They keep us asleep, make us reluctant to get up and take our places on the assembly line of the future. Also, pillows have lice. Down with snuggling, waiting for kisses. The next page of the fairy tale. In the future, we'll all sleep standing up like horses in a stall. It's far more comradely, comradely, wouldn't you say? Are you coming or not, you said. I'm getting tired of holding the door. Of course, I said, sniffing the air. There was no quarreling with the future, even if it was only the next hour's room. A party was raging. There was nowhere to sit. Tomorrow played with his Mauser, it's a machine pistol, sprawling on the couch. All the guests had telescopes trained on their feet. Well, there was still next Tuesday in the year 2050. I went out for a smoke, 
but the door had disappeared, the floor wet with broken eggs, went and said, you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. The floor wet with broken eggs, and the only way out was through. That's great. And that brings up a, uh, a question I've kind of wondered for a long time about, um, about Russian poetry. I think um, Osip Mendelstam said sort of famously that um, um, Russia is the only place poetry is respected because we murder poets, or I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But, um, um, and I always wondered why is that the case? And, and, how, and, and you would know as, as well as anybody. Um, I, I always wonder, is it a class? Is it poets were sort of a bourgeois class or is it that poet were, were poets was poetry actually um successful in like rallying people and changing opinions in russia at the time well poets walk the line because there's always been such tremendous um censorship mm -hmm. in russia so poets are always pushing 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 trying to say something that won't get them outright killed Mm -hmm. But everybody knows what they're talking about. And Russians are very, very good at reading between the lines. They do in the newspaper. They do it in my books. You see them reading Pravda and trying to figure out what's really going on. Um, so every the way poetry readers read. Mm -hmm. They read the newspaper oh, yeah. the way hmm. we read poetry. Interesting. We read between the lines. We understand what's being said. There's a... a um, uh, in 1921, there was a rally, there was a, a, a celebration of Pushkin, mm -hmm. some, you know, like 157th, I mean, it was an odd year, it wasn't a big grand year, but the celebration of Pushkin at that time meant, Pushkin meant freedom. Pushkin was code mm -hmm. for freedom. Hmm. Yeah. And they got right up to that line, and a couple of people actually went over the line. Bloch, the famous Alexander Bloch, who was the, one of the great poets of the Silver Age, was behind the House of Arts, and he was one of the speakers that day. And I actually, um, I actually do, you know, I actually do that day mm -hmm. in Chimes of Los Cathedral, where Bloch speaks about Pushkin and talks about inner a poet's inner freedom mm -hmm. that a poet has to be free not necessarily to do whatever they want and vote and you know um, do you know rally and do things in the external world but freedom of vision mm -hmm. freedom to to see what they see and Russian poets take it as a responsibility mm -hmm to tell the truth yeah, yeah. as much as they can and it's much more dangerous mm -hmm. to do there so the respect that russian poets get got and get is probably higher than anywhere else in the mm -hmm. world you know when you say a russian poet you're talking about conscience mm -hmm. yeah talking about telling the truth getting up to that line pushing it pushing it and sometimes stepping right over. So that's the difference between somebody like a Yevtushenko, somebody like a, um, somebody who could deal within the politics mm -hmm. right up to that line and people who just couldn't stay there like Blodsky. Yeah, yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, he's somebody, he's a very interesting poet and he is at the... He's one of the board members of the House of Arts. This is not made up. Mm -hmm. and his character is in there. And he had been married to Akhmatova, uh, divorced. And um, he is a very live character in the in Chimes of Lost Cathedral. And he was a very aristoc aristocratic guy. You know, he, in the most difficult cir circumstances, he was still, like, wearing a white shirt. You know how hard that must have been without hot water? Mm -hmm. You know, always dignified. And he felt like he could express himself and his religion. He was a believer and stuff right through the revolution as long as he didn't get overtly political. He mm -hmm. thought they sort of deal with the Bolsheviks. And in 1921, they shot him, uh, rounded up a bunch of intelligence and shot mm -hmm. him. And 
so he thought he had this deal. But he is a you know he is a wonderful poet, and he has a poem called the Lo- the Lost Tram that um, I use mm-hmm. in in my. Do you have it there to read? Awesome. I do. I do. Let's see if I can find it. The Lost Tram. Is that in Chimes? If yeah. so, let me know the page number, and I can put it on screen. It's uh, 534. 534? Okay. Yeah. So I took little bits and pieces of these poems rather mm-hmm. than, you know, it's not anthology. Uh, it's a living poem for, for people to be introduced to all these fabulous poets. So Gulliver captured the unreal feeling where it was a time where the symbol was taken for the thing itself. And The Lost Tram is so about that. So um, Gumilyev captured the unreal feeling of the times perfectly in his poem, The Lost Tram. And this is uh, translated by Boris Drayek. I was walking down an unfamiliar street, and suddenly I heard the call of crows and distant thunder, a ringing lute. A tram flew by before my eyes. Just how I ran onto its running board remained a mystery. The tail it trailed, even in Firebird, fiery. Anything could happen now. The clocks might talk. The trams leap their rails and whirl off to the Neva or the Nile or the land of the dead. We are all change, edging closer to the cliff's precipice. A sign. It announces in blood-swollen letters, Greengrocer. I know that instead of cabbage heads, Swedes and rutabagas, they sell the heads of the dead. The executioner with a face like an utter red-shirted, stout as an ox, has chopped off my head. Uh, She goes, Marina is walking in Petrograd, and she sees a woman trying to eat the sausages off uh, a painting on the shutter of a clothes butcher shop. Mm -hmm. And it's like she sees that this is what's happening. It's like people are confusing the, um, the symbol of something for the thing itself. And uh, it was very much, it was, you know, it was the, sur- the surreality of living in that super politically charged world where, you know, the s- symbol of something was as bad as the thing itself. Mm-hmm. So definitely... Uh, um, this is uh, part of part of Gumilyev's, uh poem about the lost tram. Yeah. Do you think um, I've kind of been wondering if um, you know poetry is sort of um, inherently anti-communist because it's such an especially lyric poetry because it's so much about the individual. And um, do you think that was sort of the problem? Did did did. Uh, did poets have as much power before communism in, in Russia, before the revolution, or was it only always, always? You know, they had the power to get shot. Mm-hmm. You know, they had the power to raise issues with the king. Mm-hmm. That uh, They were taken, you know, sent to Siberia, and, uh, um, you know, they were exiled. They were, you know, all kinds mm-hmm. of things. Because, you know, they, they were the... They were the arbiters of conscience mm-hmm. in a time where you weren't, you were just supposed to let people decide for you yeah. how things would mm-hmm. go. Oh, it's just that. Uh, but I don't think it's anti communistic, it's anti authoritarian. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that even Mayakovsky, who was, they said that Mayakovsky walked into the revolution as into his own house. Mm-hmm. He, so comfortable with it. I mean, here's he he made a wonderful poem that never you never see called uh, 150 million, which is how many Russians there uh-huh. are were at the time, and it had them going into like epic battle with Woodrow Wilson, hmm. you know, like Ilya the communist, you know, walking across the Atlantic and doing battle with Woodrow Wilson at the top. I mean. It was. It's wonderful. It starts out kind of pompous, but as it goes, Mayakovsky's too good a poet to stay with the caricature, and just it begins to expand out, and it, it's very funny and wonderful. But Mayakovsky, 
quite a poet. Um, but he's able to embrace, he's probably the heir of Whitman. Mm -hmm. He's able to embrace multitudes mm -hmm. and buoyancy. Like here's the beginning of 150 million. Um, 150 million is the name of this poem's creator. So he says, you know, <laughs> I didn't write this. 150 million people wrote this. Which only Mikulski would mm -hmm. say something like that. You know, he's a huge figure and my my uh, fictional poet Genya Kuryakin is sort of based on on Mikulski or certain aspects mm -hmm. of Mikulski. Oh, Mikulski's in this too, in the House of Arts. Um, 150 million is the name of this poem's creator. Its rhythm, a bullet. Its rhymes, a spreading fire. I mean, that's that's poetry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, who can name the Earth's brilliant designer? And so it is with my poem, work of no single writer. <laughs> it's wonderful. I do recommend it if you can find the if you can find the poem. You have to dig a little mm -hmm. bit, but it. You know, so definitely there's, you know, I mean, you have a, po a poet like Whitman. Is that anti-communistic? I wouldn't say mm -hmm. that. I would say he would feel very comfortable in the revolution. Yeah, 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 I think so. Um, so so how did you um, get into, you know, why did you write a book about the Russian Revolution? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, like everything else, you know, it's, it's historical. Mm -hmm. You know, thing, one thing leads to another. I had um, taken Russian as my language in high school and college. Uh, love, love Russia, love Russians, love mm -hmm. Russian literature. And I had written a novel that failed between uh, White Oleander and Painted Black. Oh. And uh, there was a character I really liked in that failed novel. And I wrote a short story about her in America in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know enough about her. I wanted to write more about her, but I didn't know enough about mm -hmm. her. And um, I realized that I, every time I wrote the backstory, her backstory, people liked that a lot better. Mm -hmm. People in my writer. Uh, so then I was writing the story of the Russian Revolution and this girl's part in it. Oh, wow. And it was originally in verse because I knew she was poet. Mm -hmm. So it was a novel in verse. Yeah. The... And I did 17 chapters. Oh, you know, mm -hmm. to be a novel, novel. And then her verse, her, you know, her friend's verse, and the verse of the other characters would just be in there. Mm -hmm. But it does all sound, there is hopefully the chime, the sound of, of poetry is throughout. Because I think fiction writers have to do that too. You know? mm -hmm. um, so one thing led to another. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that character sort of appeared to you and her backstory happened to be Russian, and so you to trace her roots. Is I that? I she was Russian. I always write about Russians. Mm -hmm. They're in there. They're always in there. I, I really like Russians. I like their viewpoint. I think it's very, it's a wonderful contrast to American viewpoint. Marina is passionate. There's no irony. She's passionate. She's also doesn't expect things to go. Well, mm -hmm. so there's a humor, certain kind of Russian humor that I really enjoy. So even though she goes through some really serious stuff, and she is a very serious poet, her attitude towards life, she does retain a certain sense of humor, except when really bad stuff happens, mm -hmm. and then it's just not like everybody else would be. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you mentioned Chimes of the Lost Cathedral, the title. Um, what's the symbolism of that? Well, the the um, there in Russia there is a uh, legend of the invisible city of Kitej, hmm. and Kitej was a city. This is her Marina's nanny 
tells her the story. So I, I know it the way her nanny tells it, which is uh, once upon a time, Gili uh, Bwili, uh, once upon a time, there was a city uh, built without walls on the banks of Lake Svetlijar, which is in Siberia. Uh, and it, so good was it that it, when it was... Um, attacked by the Mongols, you know, during the Mongol invasion. Russia had a very long Middle Ages because of the Mongol invasions. Uh, but when it was attacked by the Horde, so good was it that it sank beneath the waters of Lake Svetloyar hmm. entirely. Oh, wow. <laughs> if you are faithful, you at, upon the midnight, you can hear the sound of its cathedral. Oh, wow. So it's like a measure of your own purity mm -hmm. and your own faithfulness. So to me, the legend of, it comes up throughout both novels. Um, to me, that is such a symbol for the human soul that sometimes life is so crappy. Mm -hmm that anymore you feel sort of dead inside and you can't hear the bells and all is despair and then something happens and you can hear them again it's like oh my soul is not completely dead you know, there's the chimes mm -hmm. um so it's a symbol that that works its way through the book in different in different ways yeah that's a that's a great but that's verse of, that you stay alive even inside when you have to be very tough and you have to deal with very, um, you know, really horrifying things, mm -hmm. you know, to listen to the inner self. And that's what the poet does. And that's what inner freedom is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, just a great title and great symbology there. I love it. Um, do you have any more poems you could read? I do. Okay. I do. I have, I have, um, uh, a poem, let's see, there is a, uh, let's see, okay, my character has her, her boyfriend, actually her husband, the Mike Lovskian character, Genya Kuyakin, also a fictional character, um, abandons my character, Marina, uh, pregnant. She, they're, on a, uh, they're on an agit train, you know, uh, propaganda and agitation during the Civil War. They're right behind the troops. And she goes into labor just as the tracks open up for the agit train to go through into Siberia and pushing right behind the troops and keeping a fifth column from forming and, you know, um, and he, he goes with her, he goes with his train. And she was, she thought she was afraid he was going to do that. She figured he would. And yet it was really kind of a horrible thing because he just sends a poem. He sends a poem instead of money or something to help her get home. Uh, you know, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> Just as her, uh, just after her, the baby is born. So, this is the midwife. She's very ill. She has the baby. Midwife brings her this poem. It was a poem in Genya's unmistakable hand. He lettered like a madman, cubo-futuristically. Cubo Funeral for myself on the tracks at Kambarka. That's where, near the village where the baby finally is born. The bells, did you hear them? Oh, bells again. The bells, did you hear them? I'm a clown. I'm a carnival devil. Bells on my paper mache hat. They do agit plays and stuff, so there's this theatrical thing. Who would have dreamed I would drop my own heart? Hope myself. 
the crack reverberates from Petrograd to Vladivostok. But I did it. Is it weakness or strength to hang your own heart? That's the hell of it. Tenderness gets into my eyes. Now I put on my costume, break loose. He's the commander of the train. The part I play. I wrote the lines myself. It's a disaster. And yet, out of disaster, the world. We're all giving birth. No, not all of us, Genya. Not all. Yes, I'm a cold-blooded swine. Hate me. Curse me. I'm shit. Man is a puppet. Woman a mystery. I don't know anything about life. I cut my own throat here tonight. That's what you're seeing, the last of my rich red blood. Tomorrow I'll look like a man, but won't bleed. This is no place for humans. Steel and iron alone, machines, a train, an army, an idea, a war. When we're finished, we'll find the humans, show them to their new homes. Here's a joke. Did you know why there are no more horses in Petrograd? Because horses have to be fed. Where men can live on just the hope of it. That was an actual joke from the period. Doesn't that just split your sides? I should have left you with one arm. Uh, that some guy that she was living with when the train came through. That humorless chump. But I'm a demon of vanity. I was sure if I said it would be all right. It would be. I see you still on the Chernyshevsky Bridge, the moon on the ice, frost on your lashes. I lay back on the pillow, looking at the tree, baby at my breast, the midwife pouring milk in a bowl, long-haired birches streamed, so my stink Arazin had once again thrown his Persian bride to the deep, proving his loyalty to his brothers at the expense of his love. He was the tenderest of souls, and yet if vanity was at stake, he would walk into hell himself, hell itself with his chin held high. How pleased they must be with their stink of the train vanishing over the Urals, red flags ablaze. At least he remembered the frost of my lashes. So that's sort of what their mm -hmm. relationship is like. He's got, he loves her so much, but he has, his weakness is that he wants to be seen a certain way. Um, Janet, I'm, um, I'm going to hang up and too. call you back. Um, the, the bandwidth keeps mm -hmm. shrinking and it's not, it's not improving. So I think I'm just going to hang up and call you back. Hopefully we get a better connection. I'm sorry. I'm up no, it's not that. It's the actual bandwidth of the call. So let me try. It started out fine, then it sort of has been shrinking as we go. So I'm going to try to hang up and just call you right back. Okay. Yep. Okay. So we're just calling Janet Fitch back, um, having a bit of a bandwidth problem on the call. Um, but it's ringing right now. Hopefully when she picks up, there'll be less. Cause I, I don't really care about the video too much on these, but the, uh, sound, I don't want to drop out cause I want to, um, everybody to be able to hear these poems. Um, let's see. It's still ringing. Hmm. Hmm, well, she's not answering now. Let me give it another try in just a second. But um, if anybody, as I was saying before, if anybody has any questions for Janet, uh, if you're watching on the live stream, you can leave a chat message right now and I can pass those along. Um, and we have a bunch of open mic callers coming up. So all I have to do to, that, to uh, join in that way is uh, s turn on your Skype app and um, give me a call or give me a text message, I should say. Ah, this is, let's see, what well, was... It's trying to decide if it's better or not. Um, let me see. Nope, we lost you again. Hmm. Let's see.
Well, uh, let's see. Hey Janet. So, uh, okay, we have we have more bandwidth to get. I think. Uh, let me let me let's see. Man, it's the same. So so whatever happened, something happened, and we kind of lost um, the bandwidth. But I think it's fine for reading uh, reading poems. We have your your tiny little icon on the screen, and um, so that was the problem. Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure. I think it's just. Um, the uh, the connection maybe um, I don't know if uh, your your internet provider is busy right now or something. Um, <laughs> so so it, er, earlier today, uh, you know, earlier forty five minutes ago, it might have been that we had lots of bandwidth, and now it's cutting out a little bit. Or um, maybe somebody in your house is streaming a show that could be um, part of the problem too. I don't know, but uh, but let's just uh, let's read another. Do you have a, an, one or two more poems to to finish off with? I do. I do. Okay. okay. It's a, yeah, the bandwidth went up again, so so we're looking a little better now. <laughs> so that that did work. Okay. Am I still a tiny little thing? In the well, corner? it sort of fluctuates based on how much how much data it's getting. But um, you're you're midway through, <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> you you started out large and, and nice, and then you're uh, and now you're sort of half size. <laughs> but um, oh, okay. but let's finish up with like Maybe like well. two more poems from the book would be good. Okay. So this is a a poem that she writes. There's been some terrible events in the book, and I did want to write. This was just a, the first poem that she reads at the House of Arts. She's invited to read, which is a very big deal, because they didn't have paper in those days. In, in, during the Revolution, there was no paper. Yeah, I was wondering about that. The readings, mm -hmm. the readings were super important mm -hmm. like if you got to read a house of arts that's like getting your you know getting your work published and yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah how did they even um you know i know she she pulls out a journal and writes um i've only read i, I have to admit to everybody i've only read a third of the second book so so i haven't gotten everything but but where did they get paper to write if you're in a bread line and starving and trying to get enough protein for your um your child and your stomach uh, where do you find the she paper? Steals, she steals it. And there's also, they find a whole cache of receipt books mm -hmm. at the House of Art. Ah. When they broke, they expanded, they found like something that had been a, an abandoned bank or something. Mm -hmm. And so they were using that paper. Everybody loved that. But she actually steals some from work. Uh, yeah, that's just really so, cool to think of, is that, you know, because we take it so much for granted now as writers that yeah. we have as much as we want. <laughs> yeah, so this is, I can't care, uh, describe it too much because it's like a big spoiler. Um, so you just get the poem. Under the trees at Cambarca. She slept all winter covered with white eiderdown, curled at the foot of a hard gray bed. Now it is spring. Rain waters the earth. The spark that glowed between my two cupped hands didn't last the night. The wind blew it out and the world went as dark as the devil's armpit. Oh, give me the trees at Kimbarka, soft-lipped summer green. And gold in the fields and the scythe's ancient song. Yes, I know the future's past. The leaves fallen from the family tree. Sweep them, sweep them away. But leave me the green trees of Kambarka, the gold of the fields, the long dusty road, the midwife's shack, the slow rivers turning, the pattern of leaves in her dazzled eyes. Here's one called The Buried Miner, which she slips into Mayakovsky's pocket after he reads that 150 million, trying to remind him that he's still a poet. Mm -hmm. he does, he's not just a mouthpiece. I wrote a poem for Mayakovsky that night just for him and managed to slip it into his pocket before he left for Moscow. The Buried Miner to VM. The mine collapsed. The great timbers could no longer hold against the weight of the whole earth, crushing the hundreds who dug there 
in the soft seam of Donbass coal. Yet by a miracle, one miner still lives. Down the black miles, his leg caught in the rock, he lives and lives. Is it a miracle or hell? The lone miner sings to keep himself company. He recites a prayer he once knew but doesn't believe, then remembers an old poem from school days. He whispers it over and over. Sometimes a man must be alone. Sometimes no comrade soften his days. Sometimes there is only despair. I have been that lone miner. Love is not enough. When the weight of the earth falls, there is only you and a poem, and sometimes only the poem. Hmm. That was outstanding, Janet. Um, let me ask one more question. I just It's so fascinating the way you get into these characters and then the different voices sort of come out of you. Is there a difference between writing the poems and writing the novel? You know, is, is it like writing dialogue um, for the characters in your novel? Does it have that feel? Or is it like some different thing? Is there some kind of way that you do it that's sort of separate because it's poetry? Or is it just part of the inhabiting your characters? It's... It's a distillation of the character, mm -hmm. isn't poetry? I mean, it's a distillation of the character of everything they've been through and their way of thinking and their their um, the music of their uh, you know what they think po poetry is mm -hmm. and should do. And she is someone who speaks to one other person. She's not someone who speaks to a generation or speaks to a to society mm -hmm. she just you know so she's a quiet one so here's one about petersburg at the beginning of the first novel they throw uh, they cast the wax for on new year's eve for their fortune and so there's a seafaring theme in both books she gets a a sailing ship is what is her fortune and it's right at the beginning of the first book so Petersburg is the is one of the few uh, seafaring cities in a landlocked nation and a huge landlocked nation. The sea doesn't play much in Russian consciousness. So Petersburg is a very special place because it has this very maritime feel to it. And we also have the revolt of the sailors at the end of the revolution. So this is about the Petersburg is basically dying. It's been cut off from uh, cut off by a blockade for uh, the during the Civil War, like like it was contagious, which the West did think it was contagious. They were afraid that communism would be contagious. So this is about that. She's sitting in a in the collective apartment everybody's in one room because they're freezing and they have to conserve their wood. On one, And she's writing on one of those stolen pads. Petersburg, the seafaring. You opened your arms to the world, sailed out nose to the great earth's winds. But now... The world's retreated, and Petrograd lies dying, like an old sailor in a bed by the window, legs black with gangrene, no nurse, nurse to bathe him tenderly. She was in the hospitals during the war. Yet despite the stench of death, he still smells the brine. No longer does your ship leap beneath you, dolphins doubling in the wake. Once the silver line of any distant shore under gull-winged light blue skies was your homeland. Oh, for those windward wild days, a brazen long-limbed crew, dazzling white-toothed argonauts. Yes, yes, old man, 
I too have stolen golden fleece and tasted the oxen of the sun. Well, very nice. Thanks so much, Janet. Um, I should mention um, you. that uh, you've been doing a Writer Wednesday for, I think you said three years on Facebook, right? Is that, do you say three years? I say, two. you know, I have <laughs> 60 some. So yeah, I would say at least, you know, a year oh, okay. and a half, two years. Yeah, and so now um, Janet's doing a Writer Wednesday, uh, which is about 45 minutes or so usually uh, um, um, lesson on writing. And she's moved it over to YouTube, and you can find the link in the show notes at the bottom underneath the screen here. So, uh, Janet, you're going to be on, on camera tomorrow for Writer Wednesday, right? Doing something? That's right. <laughs> And I'm live also on Facebook uh, on my author page, so you can ask questions if you like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what do you think about that? Is it? Um, it's kind of interesting that um, you can get so much for free. You know, this is the kind of insight that you know people at the at USC had paid big dollars to get, and you're uh, able to give it away. <laughs> um, how was your experience with that kind of um, you know the, the new technology and um, what you can do with it? Well, I just think that um, I'm somebody who doesn't need a lot of permission to do stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't need the institution to give me the good housekeeping so of approval. When I learned, was learning to write, I had to learn, you know, just bits and pieces. Um, and I want to, you know, do that for people who you know, who can't do, a, you know, a program, mm -hmm. who are in midships in their life and, uh, you know, could use a little insight, um, as I could, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, I didn't yeah. program, I couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. Um, I was out in the outer planet. <laughs> and, uh, so I figure if I can shorten things up for people so they don't have to make every mistake <laughs> in the book, uh -huh. like I, yeah. uh, I want to. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one one last question: um, Is the Revolution of Rena M going to be a, a, a movie too? Any any producers hit you up yet? Because it is so cinematic, it would make such oh, a great okay. epic. <laughs> and I oh, well, I can't wait to finish reading it, and then I want to see it too. So, uh, well, I got to say that there was there is somebody who it, could actually make mm -hmm. it. Um, is seriously interesting. Well, I will in definitely it. keep my fingers crossed. So, so everybody, please put out good mm -hmm. vibes, <laughs> enough money yeah. to make a big piece about the Russian mm -hmm. Revolution. So there we go. It's such a fascinating time, and it would be so great for poetry just to have um, that kind of story be told, um, you know, for a, a huge audience. Um, yeah, because the poets at the time, I mean, in Russia during this period, the Silver Age, I don't think Westerners realized how famous mm -hmm. these people were. Yeah, and you know, you working know? in poetry for 15 years, I still don't even understand. It's kind of, uh, I, I, you know, I... F well, just picture, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, this is sort of demeaning in a bit, but picture, you know, Paul McCartney mm -hmm. walking down the street yeah, yeah. and meeting up with ginger baker <laughs> on a street corner uh -huh. and going to the coffee house and, and making you know i mean all of these people were there just in that city mm -hmm. walking around living their lives in plain sight of everybody who and that's how famous mm -hmm. they were. yeah yeah you know? Well, that is so cool. Well, this is a book that I think every poet should read, and I can't wait to read. I'm gonna. I, I decided to stop about a third of the way through so I could read the first book before I <laughs> kept reading because I didn't want to miss any of it. But um, um, but thanks so much for writing this book and um, for for being a patron of poetry. I really appreciate it. And th thanks for joining us on this on this podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I'll talk to you later. Have a great night. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. So that was Janet Fitch reading from her uh, novel. Well, her two novels. There's uh, The Revolution of Marina M. And the most recent, which just came out this summer, the sequel, Chimes of a Lost Cathedral. And I really do think every poet 
should read this novel. I, I've been wanting to um, read more about the Russian Revolution and learn more about Russian poetry and um, for a long time, and I just haven't yet. And this is the perfect enter- you know, opportunity in a really entertaining way because it's she. Uh, if you haven't read any of Janet's other books before, she she paints a scene with um, serious poetry um, better than than any you know most novelists I can think of. Um, so it's a real joy to read this book, and I hope you uh, pick up a copy. So we're going to move on to our open mic portion of the show, and um, we have a couple people who asked to be on. And first, we're going to start with. Um, some of the pre-recorded poems. The first one, if I can find it, um, let's see. So Alicia Hammond um, submitted this a while ago, and I said that I was going to be playing this poem on the open mic, and um, somehow I didn't do it. And I didn't even realize I didn't do it. So we're definitely gonna do hers first tonight. And this is Alicia Hammond. And um, Alicia Hammond is a young writer, guitarist, and web comic from uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia. Uh, she was inspired by the scene she saw at her bus stop. And usually there's nothing, but this day was unusual, so she wrote this poem about you know six weeks ago or something. And here is Alicia Hammond reading Morning Driveway. Hi. My name is Alicia, and I'm recording from Lawrenceville, Georgia. This is a poem called Morning Driveway, and I uh, hope you like it. I stand in the driveway in the morning, waiting. It had been too warm for anything of note to happen until today. As the wind blew, the trees danced. I pulled up the collar of my windbreaker and watched their grace. In the wind, the oaks were elegant, the ends of their branches grasping feebly at the air as the trees twirled. And as the trees danced, the crows woke. I pulled down the hood of my windbreaker and watched their flight. Murders upon murders raced from the branches into the hazy gray sky. They dotted the blank expanse as inkwood paper. And as the wind blew, the trees danced and the crows woke. While I stood in the driveway in the morning, waiting. So that was uh, Alicia Hammond from Lawrenceville, Georgia, reading her poem, Morning Driveway. Thanks so much for sharing that, Alicia, and um, thanks for waiting. Um, It's been uh, three weeks since I said I would would run that. Um, Okay, now we're going to call up um, Liz Gallo. Um, She's been on before, maybe once or twice. Liz, hi, just let me pull you in one second, and um, we'll get you on. It worked the first time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's Liz Gallo. Uh, we see you and we hear you. So, and you're calling from Toronto, Cal- Canada, if I remember right. Uh, what yep, do you What yep. do you have for us today? Um, I have a poem called uh, "Lemon Pie," mm-hmm. and because I love lemon pie, and yeah, it was um, published on Medium's platform um, for uh, called Lit Up, a publication on Medium that's called Lit Up. Mm-hmm. So it was published in May. Great. I'll just get right into it. It's called Lemon Pie. I'll bake a lemon pie, and you'll wonder what it means. Sitting on a deck, watching twilight fade, running the fork between my lips. Is this it? Sweet and sticky tartness on my tongue. I lick my thumb. Do you like it too? Smile pied in the dark at night. It's just us two. Will we get to the love part? Pretending you're still cool and I don't care. No, that isn't love in the air. Only lemons and gin, laughter, but not sin. I'll have another piece. We'll both have another drink. Almost touching, we stop. Wait. Leaving crumbs on the plate. Next time, we'll decide to take things inside. Awesome. Thanks so much, Liz. I was hoping uh, no one would do any food poems because I'm actually starving. <laughs> and that, that sounded delicious. I haven't eaten anything uh, all day, pretty much. So, uh, <laughs> but great poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. And thanks so much for calling in and, and joining us live. It's really fun to uh, have, have regulars. So appreciate it. Thanks. 
Thank you. And also Jim Velva says, who doesn't love lemon pie? Which um, I'd like to find the person who doesn't love lemon pie and talk to them about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing, Liz, and I'll, I'll hope you call in again. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, that, was, that was Liz Gallo. And uh, let's do another of the pre-recorded. But if anybody else would like to call in, I have two poets who are regulars lined up if there's room. And uh, if there's any new people who haven't called in before, be brave and call in uh, and do a live poem over Skype. It's a lot of fun. All you have to do is send me a text message right now over um, uh, on the Skype app. There's a chat. And uh, send me a text message, and I will tell you you're on, and then I will give you a call when the timing is perfect. Um, so let's look at another open mic poem now. Um, here we go. This is uh, Carrie Magnus Radna uh, from New York, New York. Um, Carrie Magnus Rag Radna is an archival audiovisual cart cart cataloger at the New York Public Library. That's interesting because we have a, um, I think we're going to do a tribute to librarians coming up at some point uh, soon. Uh, for the, for an issue of Rattle. Um, anyway, she's a, she works at the New York Public Library. She's also a singer, a lyricist, songwriter, and a poet who loves to travel. Her poems have been in a bunch of places like Oracular Tree, Muddy River Review, Poetry Superhighway, Tuck Magazine, etc. Her first chapbook, Conversations with Dead Composers at Carnegie Hall, was published last January. And her second chapbook, Remembering You as I Go Walking, is out from Boxcar, Boxwood Star Press. It was just published this August. So here she is, Carrie Magnus Radna. Hi there. My name is Carrie Magnus Radna, and I'm from New York City. This uh, poem, Self Reflection of Interviewee, Interviewer was um, sort of like a, a prompt poem, in a way. I wrote this for um, a reading that, that, that I, I'll, I will be attending, and it is for the autumnal uh, equinox, and, and the, um, the theme of it, besides the, the coming fall year, is self-reflection. And for me, self-reflection is pretty dicey. It's it's hard for me to like uh, really you know dig deep and you know not not sounding like um, you know a kid or or um, or when I was twenty, I just had like this um, massive dream that I was going to be famous, like I, I was going to be a uh, best new artist at the Grammys and because I sang really well and I was going to be a star and everything and you know what what kids you know the shit that they uh, think about when they're growing up so I didn't want to you know fall into that trap again and um, realization is just like um, knowing um, you know putting old dreams to bed and uh, getting in some new ones so, um, so I had a really hard time, um, writing about this poem until a couple of days ago, I was talking with my uh, friend Mark and we were talking about, um, uh, the Freudian's, um, um, appearances of psyche, which is, uh, the id, the ego and the super ego. And we're, we're just talking about like, um, the elements of both, all three things. And that kind of got me thinking. What if, you know, the superego was not like a judge or maybe an interviewer? Because when I was growing up, um, since I always thought I was going to be famous, like a, a famous a singer, I always thought of this um, voice, you know, tell, telling me how to do good was more of an interviewer. Like, so, Carrie... What would you, um, what would, what you should have done in this situation, or, yes, I do think that you're going to be a rock star, or, don't do, 
do that kind of thing. You know, just, you know, super ego, you know, full of herself, knows what to do, will tell you what to do. And- okay, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. I like a good intro, but that's a bit long for an intro. Let's just jump right to the poem if I can find it. Of interviewee. Okay, here we go. So this poem is called Self-Reflection of Interviewee Interviewer by Carrie Magnus Rodna. Hope you enjoy. My careful superego since childhood is convinced that my ego will be famous someday. So she records and states her questions and queries in mock interviews, being fully in control of her own emotions as the edge slash ego spills over, gushing about her hopes of being best new artist at the Grammys, not rushing stories of the blows, the stings of arrows when the ego is wounded by herself and or others. She'll recount the notes with written down, the wounds and verbal diarrhea that the id has written and hidden away, the happy slash down days, the dark nights without stars, the bars and cars and lovers lost at what cost, the strokes to one's self, the moldy moments left rotting on the shelf, Dreams gained and lost, revamped, renewed. Love and loss is true. The binges, the hinges, the windows opened and closed. The dogs hosed. The dry cats who stick around. The friends who dick around and play along. And they start to sing your favorite songs without any reason at all. Thick and thin. The ego's losses and wins. The sins committed under duress, say by confessing the id's wrongs to God and to superego. Who did or thought about doing all the things that ego has described in detail? Superego could wail and flail, but chooses not to. She report and reflect as if ego was a true sister, a comrade in arms, a star in the making, hopefully, eventually waking up her realization that fame is almost impossible to possess. Money is unfairable. Visibility is food for the masses. And importance is only possible with one's self. So that was Carrie Magnus Radna with uh, self-reflection of interviewee, interviewer. Uh, thanks so much, Carrie, for that poem. And um, it, it was a little long on the intro. I, I realize um, I've never, uh, I keep telling people they should include an intro, but I've never, never mentioned how long it probably should be. I think about a minute is a good intro length, but we do want to f- feel like you're here, you know, in case uh, it wants to feel like a real open mic. So, uh, you know, say where you're, you're recording and, uh, and a little bit about the poem, and, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, I think about a minute is a good length, though. Um, that was a great poem, though. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, let me give a call to... Uh, so you have Michelle Parks and Joshua Corwin, who are also regular callers. They both have uh, short short things they want to do. So uh, let me give Michelle Parks a call and see what she's up to tonight. And it's ringing. Uh, if you're... Just a reminder, we still have time. If anybody wants to do the Skype open mic, you can uh, send me a text message at Rattle Poetry over Skype, and um, I will get you on. But right now we have um, uh, Michelle Parks. So uh, let me bring her in just one second, and here she is, Michelle Parks. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm having a lot of fun. Did you like uh, Janet Fitch? Did you get to see the uh, beginning of the show? Yeah, that was awesome. I really had a good time listening to it. Yeah, it's a good it's a good novel. I hope everybody reads it. Um, so, what do you have for us tonight? What what kind of poetry? It's a short poem. It's called Icarus. Uh huh. Words lack strength to salve the bruise of your touch. Yet I miss it so much. 
that connection between fear of the Father and love, was that ever enough? Reaching for heaven, hanging myself on chains, I thought to be halos. My wings melt in the sun. I grow nocturnal. I hide in shadow. I cover my scars. Damned by devotion, I shrink before God. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I really enjoyed that. Uh, thanks so much for calling in. Good to see you again. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Yeah, I'll you still too. Be listening. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See you later. Okay. Uh, let me just call uh, our last caller for tonight too, and we'll get that, and then we'll do the, um, then we'll do the uh, last couple pre-recorded. But Joshua Corwin, also a regular caller, he wanted to share some news and uh, a short poem, a little little cento. I think he said he had. So I'm giving him a call. Oh, it says he's unavailable. So I'll, we'll try Joshua in just a little bit. Uh, that was Joshua Corwin. If you're listening, uh, I'll try to call you in a couple minutes. Um, actually, he accidentally clicked the wrong button. I'll just call, call him back right now. Because the nice thing about the chat, this, it's just amazing that uh, we can always um, talk to each other over, over chat and message and stuff, too, as we're doing this whole show. Um, so... Here is Joshua Corwin. Uh, let me pull you into the stream, and um, here you go. Uh, you're kind of big. Let me shrink you a little bit on the video. You have a lot more bandwidth than the last couple of people. Okay, so Joshua Corwin, uh, you're calling from L.A., and um, your your new literary magazine just started up. So what have you got for us tonight? Oh, you're on mute, actually. So why don't you... Uh... Is it good? Yeah, you're good now. Yep, yep, your mute button was just on. Okay, so what do you have for us tonight? Up? Yep, you're up. You're good. So I actually, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a treat, if that's okay. Uh, I have been working on a manuscript from my book, and this is something that I just, like, edited down and for some reason just feel compelled to read. And, yes, my literary magazine, Centopede.com, is now up and running for submissions. There's still gonna be more work on it, but thanks so much, Tim. Yep. This is called Memory Smile, actually. Uh, yep. I see homeless in the Santa Monica street. I'm in Starbucks. Out a window, a memory. A colleague I tried to help get sober, my age between 24 and 26. White, Jewish, male, upper middle class, and an only child like me. ASD, ADHD, anxiety disorder, processing delay like me. Marijuana addict like me. He stayed sober. Sheer self-will, refused help. His mind wouldn't let him, he couldn't say the words when he tried to vocalize them. His mind fought back. The space of death can be a human being. A clock distracting miscellaneous illnesses, mental health specialists couldn't help him. His mind shield him. He wouldn't even let him have knowledge of his helplessness, inability to ask, becoming positive that you'd rather be insincere and incinerated, creating a space of death. I peer through the window. I, he convinced himself homeless. Two, peer through a memory. Three, ASD, ADHD, anxiety, processing, delay. Four, friends, only colleagues. Five, I'm too busy, out the window of compassion. Six, am I a memory? Seven, a garbage bin, the eyes, reflection. Eight, himself, shot meth, OD on fentanyl. Nine, he said he'd never be homeless. Ten, he said he'd never do meth. Eleven, he only smoke weed. Twelve, maybe drink every now and then. I found out he had passed from another friend, a colleague. 
oozing windows. I think the memory died. So why not just smile? Hmm. Well, thanks for sharing that, Josh. Thanks. Powerful yeah. poem. And thanks for, thanks for calling in. Always good to see you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, have a great night. You too. Bye. Okay, so that was our last uh, person we have lined up for the open mic, but we have two more pre-recorded poems, so uh, let's get into those. Next up, um, this is The Night I Wrote Josh Tillman a Letter by Aaron Bilmier. And um, let's see, where's her little bio? Uh, Aaron Bilmier says, uh, I don't really have any fancy creds that might be interesting to your listeners. I'm not a huge fan of talking about myself, except, you know, in poems. So let's let her do that. This is Erin Bilmier. And uh, I forgot to write down where she's, where she's uh, recording this from, so hopefully she says it. But here she is with the night I wrote Josh Tillman a letter. Hi, my name is Erin Bilmier, and I'm calling from Michigan. And I'm going to be reading a poem titled The Night I Wrote Josh Tillman a Letter. It appeared in the winter issue of The Moth. Dear Father John Misty, I know that's not your real name, but addressing you as Josh somehow feels too personal. I don't know why. We're both just kids from the suburbs. You from Maryland, me from Michigan. Two eight-letter states that start with M. I bet you used to ride your bike past your friend's house, and he would wave and say, Hi, Josh. I used to do that, too. So maybe I should just call you Josh. Father John Misty is such a long name. Josh is easier. We're not really alike, Josh, you and I, except in the ways that we're all alike. Fear and depression and love. Well, I guess that's not everyone. Not everyone is depressed, right? Sometimes I wonder. But you seem smart, Josh. Smart about people and relationships like a wise Buddha master. It's the reason I'm writing you. The thing is, a man I adore recently left me. He said I sucked all the joy from our relationship. He used the word vicissitude. Then he blocked me in every possible way. I'm not sure how it happened, Josh. I once said some harsh words to him. He said he wasn't angry, but I think it left a hairline crack that continued to shift further and further apart. I want so badly to fix it. I feel like I'm suffocating. Yesterday I saw a solitary duck in my backyard and I wept for an hour. I was hoping you might be able to help, that you would have some insight into what he is thinking. You're a lot alike. You both have beards. And you both like pizza. Anyway, it's hard out here, Josh, on the front line of dating. A lot of people leave your heart worse than they found it. So that was Aaron Bilmier reading The Night I Wrote Josh Tim a Letter. Thanks so much for sharing that, Aaron. Really appreciate it. And I should remind everybody I haven't done this yet, that if you uh, want to do a pre-recorded open mic poem, all you have to do is record it and send me the uh, text of the poem so I can show it on screen. And uh, go to rattle.com slash rattlecast, and you'll find the instructions there. You just do it through Submittable, like anything else. And um, and uh, you probably want to do poems that have already been published, because some people might consider this like publication on YouTube or something. Uh, I think that's kind of silly, but that's the way the world works sometimes. Um, so you might want to think about that, or you might want to rebel and just not care. Uh, whatever you want to do, just send any kind of audio recording. They work really well just using your uh, voicemail on your phone, um, you know, just using a uh, voice memo, I should say. So record it, uh, send it to yourself, upload it through uh, Submittable, and you're good to go. So, so feel free to try that if you don't want to use Skype. Now we have one more pre-recorded poem tonight. And let me see what it is. Um, ah, this is... I don't even know how to say this. We'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to find out in just a second. Um, but here is... Uh, the poem, this is by um, Dean Barker uh, from Poland. And I probably should read this whole introduction. So um, it's kind of important, I guess. In Poland, 
there's a saying that the father is the head of the family, but the mother is the neck. That's an interesting expression. In the run-up to their wedding, um, many young Polish women feel reassessed, scrutinized afresh, not only by the future mother-in-law, but by pan melody to be. I think that means maybe mother-in-law, but I'm not sure. Uh, will Pan Melody be up to the task, be able to care for him like Mamusia? I guess it's the bride-to-be. Um, to cook and clean, to supplement his income with her own, will she be mindful of her membrane, to be able to con conjugally provide safely every month? Mamus Mamusia, insisting you call her that, will never be far enough away because her son won't allow it, or he'll move her in, no matter how pokey your accommodation. New, new, new Mamusia... Let me just put this on the screen. Hang on, you can read along. It's, I think it's interesting. Uh, here we go. Um, where were we? Numa Musia and her neck will otherwise visit too often, whether it takes one bus or six, arriving to clean where you haven't sufficiently, to deliver bags of produce from Dezuko, fill the fridge with jars of Lexco, jars of hammered meat, even cooked potatoes sprinkled with dill in a jar. It'll be worse once a baby's on its way, perhaps almost welcome once it's arrived up to a point until postnatal depression, as good an excuse as any, cues up the perfect moment to scream her out of the front door. Then whoever will listen, other necks, their own bags of jars rattling on the bus from the first bus home until a forced reconciliation days later will hear that, oh yes, she knew this day would come, oh yes. Pani Mulati is from a longer piece a narrative called Hedge Falcons, published in Brand Magazine in the UK. So, um, so that is interesting. And this is Dean Barker from Poland. And uh, here, uh, we'll see how to actually say that. Penny Melody or something like that. And here he goes. Dean Barker. Hello, my name is Dean Barker. I'm recording this from Poland. The poem is called Penny Morda and it's about a Polish wedding reception and a young bride feeling somewhat held up to the light. After weeks of intense preparation building steadily to this pitch since the day a day was named, the last 24 hours of religious ritual, vodka and dance, her family and his, and ritual, vodka, a stifling summer's night, vodka, family and formality, a family feud, a vodka resurrected, peace brokered with vodka, blistered feet and a cumbersome wedding dress, hemline blackened, frayed by midnight, held free of feet as every man and male child deigns to dance with its contents and dwell her from the end of a finger. Your stream is met in full flood, met and drained, or were still met, chased back to its source, and plugged underground with cooking that would offend a starving, let alone your husband's mother. So that was uh, Dean Barker reading Panim Lodi. And uh, that is the last poem for today. Hope you enjoy the show. Um, and um, let's see, who is up for tomorrow, for next week? Uh, so let me put on this. So next week we have Francesca Bell in her new book, Bright Stain. That's going to be another great episode. We have so many great episodes lined up. Uh, but Francesca Bell, I'll probably tell the story again next week. But um, the first issue that I ever worked on at Rattle was... Um, had a, had a poem by Francesca Bell. And, and the first person who ever called the office while I was working at Rattle... Um, called to say, oops, sorry, uh, called to say, um, oops, I'm screwing this up, um, called to say, uh, when is, uh, you know, where can I find a book by Francesca Bell? And that was 2004. And uh, Francesca Bell has a book now, Bright Stain by Red Hen Press. And uh, we'll have her on next week. She was also interviewed in rattle number 56, I think it was. Uh, you can see that's the cover anyway. Um, so, so I'm looking forward to that, and we will see you next week. Thanks so much for joining us, and uh, hope you have a great week. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye. <laughs>